think the first thing that I would suggest is not being afraid uh, on uh, pushing these boundaries uh, outside the comfort zone. Uh, often, uh, you know, we are afraid to take some challenges that uh, we don't think we, are, we will be able to fulfill. Uh, but in reality, when you are there and you start to uh, push towards a goal, you, your mind and your creativity uh, comes and help uh, in order to achieve a specific goal. And that's definitely the first suggestion. The second one is uh, being involved more often on community events. Community often is underrated and uh, I truly believe that uh, being engaged with the community uh, will allow you to see the same topic and the same knowledge that you have from different perspectives and different angles. And that is invaluable because then you can start to think on different ways to solve problems that uh, you wouldn't think before. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, failure, in my opinion, uh, are just part of the process. Um, usually, if you think about failure, it's composed by three stages. There is an assumption that you made, uh, there is the action that you are making in order to, uh, let's say, fulfill the, the assumptions, uh, and then at the end you have an outcome. That could be a success or a failure. But the outcome uh, uh, as a failure is not a negative thing. It's definitely a positive one because you tested some assumption and uh, uh, you understood that they're not working. Definitely they could have an impact. So therefore, uh, more than uh, aiming for a large goal, it's better taking a large goal and breaking apart in multiple steps. And then you have fast failing. And that is the best way for learning uh, uh, something. And if you fail fast, it means that you can recover fast. And uh, when you fail fast, it means that the, the scope of the, of the work is really tiny, so you can change the trajectory uh, very quickly. And that's, for me, the, the, the key of the success. In, currently, in the zone, we are working a lot with serverless technologies uh, on AWS, and um, 40 roughly 40% of our infrastructure is serverless. Definitely something that uh, I encourage to look at, uh, mainly because uh, it, it will solve a lot of problems on uh, scalability. Uh, currently, we cannot use serverless on the critical path of our project, but in reality, we are using serverless for many other services, back office, uh, highly cacheable APIs, and so on. Um, I truly believe that in two years' time, three years' time max, we will uh, work mainly with serverless for the reason that infrastructure is becoming a commodity. Uh, Personally, technology-wise, uh, I think it depends, uh, so if you, if, if you think about programming languages, it really depends on what uh, um, you're looking for. I don't think there is a, a front runner, but it depends uh, what you need to do. So we are using, for instance, a combination of Golang uh, and Node.js. Um, Node.js mainly because uh, we, have, uh, uh, we are using a heavily JavaScript in the zone, uh, and therefore uh, having uh, uh, teams that are working end-to-end -end with, with JavaScript is, is a plus for us, uh, in particular when we have cross-functional teams. Uh, Golang is mainly used for uh, APIs that have high throughput. Uh, for us, in particular, because we are dealing with live events, uh, we have a massive throughput and transaction per second that are happening a few minutes before uh, a kickoff of a match, uh, and therefore uh, we need to have not only scalability and scaling horizontally, but also we need to use as much as possible the hardware. So Golang is allowing us to, to do that. In the future, I think uh, um, it, the programming language is more a tool for express yourself. Then there are definitely some plus and cons, uh, pros and cons between uh, languages. Uh, but in reality, nowadays, I struggle to see uh, one language that could rule them all. Uh, it's just an expression of ourselves and our intention. Then we need to be really careful and uh, rely a lot on cloud providers. And I think nowadays, uh, unless you are dealing with something impossible, there are tons of options uh, in front of us. And I struggle to see one that uh, uh, is the only one to take. But there are different paths that could lead to the same outcome. I think uh, mm, more than technology, uh, what I encourage uh, any front-end developer is focusing more on uh, the principles and uh, the basics. So I think uh, learning programming paradigms like functional, imperative, uh, uh, reactive, uh, understanding when to use them and why to use them, uh, and deeply understand the design patterns and abstract um, uh, yourself in uh, uh, learning the architecture and going behind the framework, it helps way more than learning deeply a framework. Mainly because today we are using uh, React, Vue, or Angular, 
but in reality we don't know in five years time uh, what's going on and what would be the next big thing. So if you rely and abstract yourself on a uh, uh, key concept, then the shift from uh, uh, one framework to another one it would be easy and uh, uh, it, you, you won't take much time. Uh, instead, if you rely only and you focus only on the framework, uh, you will have problems because you need to, to completely unwind your brain or, and thinking in a completely different way. So um, usually what I have learned uh, in my career, at the beginning I was a developer and then now I'm a VP of architecture, uh, uh, focusing on design patterns, focusing on the abstraction concepts will allow you to be more successful in the long run and uh, you will always be up, up to date because in reality those things are not changing that often like frameworks and technologies. Yeah, so uh, community manager, I think, uh, is uh, a vocation, uh, first of all. It's not something that uh, someone is imposing to uh, someone else. Uh, I really like being a, a community manager, mainly because being in touch with the community, I think, is the best way for learning stuff. Um, I don't feel under pressure at all uh, for being a community manager, and I don't think I have like uh, the perfect recipe uh, for being a community manager. What I would suggest, though, to not create too much expectations is uh, a role that is facilitating the community. You are a servant leader for the community. And that's what, what it is for me, a community manager. Um, my community, for instance, we don't have sponsors. We rely completely on uh, um, some companies that are hosting us. And if they want to provide uh, food and drinks, great. If they don't, fine as well. We are there for, for the, the technology part. It's a community made uh, by developers for developers. and that. I think the spirit uh, of, of uh, this community um, is because um, I, I was a developer in the past and that helped me to understand what I was looking for. And I think often we are looking at the communities like uh, a way to, uh, let's say, show how, uh, our, how good we are uh, involved in the community, but in reality we should be behind the scene, behind the curtain, and just facilitating other people and learning from them, more than being on the spot, uh, on the stage, and stuff like that. One of the rules that we have in, in my community is that the, the uh, staff cannot do any talk. And that was uh, a clear direction for me, uh, and a lot of people are surprised because uh, in London as well, in other uh, countries, um, a lot of community managers are the first speakers, and they are well known in this. And personally, I, I don't believe in this because we are not creating the community for ourselves. We are creating a community for the others and for community themselves. And you need to create a, a place where people can express themselves. Junior developers, uh, senior developers, tech leads. Those are the people that should be heavily involved in the community and help to, to trace uh, the um, uh, path for all the future developers, junior developers, senior developers.